I just came across this article, eight must know tips for writing clean code with JavaScript. And I'm gonna do a blind reaction. Let's go. What's up everyone? My name is James Q Quick and I do weekly videos on web development related topics. I do a lot with JavaScript and actually one of my biggest videos is I think five must know tips for JavaScript, five things you must know as a JavaScript developer or something like that. Uh, I'll have a link to the card that you can go check out if you want to. And I saw this uh, tagline for an article is actually coming from the daily.dev extension. So just a, an aside, this is a cool extension that you can add in Chrome. This is not a sponsor, just something that I use. And this is where I find a lot of the articles and things that I read in tech. So you can choose the things you're interested in. You could bookmark stuff, upvote, et cetera. And I came across this article with uh, must know tips, must know uh, for writing clean code with JavaScript. So I'm curious if you haven't read this yet, I'm curious before you even go through this video, let me know in the comments what you think the tip should be or what your tips would be before you watch the rest of these and then maybe add an additional comment after about your reactions, things you think are missing or don't fit, et cetera. So I'm just gonna kind of walk through this. I haven't done a ton of these videos. You can give feedback on like if this is interesting or not, but let's go ahead and just break it down and talk through this. So I, like most people, um, go through and look at basically headlines for articles as I skim things. Uh, so we're just gonna kind of go through that. So the first one is to use a try catch on all API requests and JSON methods. The first thing I would do is, is definitely make this just more generic. Anything that can throw an error probably will throw an error as a, as a developer. I don't know if it's necessarily like a clean code tip. I think it's just like a best practices tip overall is you have to handle errors. Uh, we've probably all written code where we call a function, we don't handle an error and it uh, throws an error and it breaks the entire app where it actually just kills the node process or, or whatever it is. So I think focusing, I think this is a good one to have and just past practices with JavaScript. It's also something that is wildly overlooked in demos and tutorials, and I am guilty of that as well. So if you watch any of my videos and you realize that I'm not handling errors, feel free to comment and call me out uh, in the comments as well. But I think this is a good one, a fun one to have as a topic. I would tweak it a little bit, but this is on API requests and JSON methods. So I think probably the most basic example here making a fetch request, so that's an API request, and then JSON method. So when you make a fetch request by default, you get back a response, you then need to convert that response to JSON. That could throw an error if it's uh, poorly formatted or it's not actually JSON and you try to convert it to JSON, that could throw an error. So you have to make sure that you handle that to make sure your code actually works. So uh, use try catch on anything that could throw an error. That's a lot of stuff. Uh, also, this is interesting because this is now a more modern syntax for JavaScript where traditionally you're gonna use try catch when you're using something like an await inside of a func. I guess it doesn't have to be, but using like async await instead of like an error first callback. Uh, so error first callback were much more popular a few years ago. Now it's becoming more popular to use async await. I've got a video on that as well. I'm a big fan of async await. Anyway, so make sure that you're handling all errors in your application. Now the next one, uh, I think this is spot on for uh, for writing clean code or just like visually pretty code, and I'll throw in another tool here, is to use a linter like ESLint and TSLint. I'm actually kind of curious. I thought TSLint was deprecated. Cool, it is. So uh, TSLint, the extension in VS Code is deprecated. Um, and it says, please look into migrating your project to ESLint. So that may be a good piece of feedback for this article. Uh, by the way, shout out to the, the author, and I'll have a link to this. So you can go and check it out. But Alex O'Meyer, uh, make sure to check him out as well in, in his content. So uh, make sure to read the article, leave a positive comment to support them, uh, and uh, go through and, and uh, read it out. So uh, use the linter, ESLint, uh, 100%. Uh, also, Prettier is another piece of that. So uh, Prettier will, if you combine the two, Prettier will help prettify your code move things to the right line, remove unnecessary spacing, give you appropriate spacing, et cetera. ESLint can also do that. It can also do that with Prettier. It also will give you rules and guidelines for how to format your code. Um, and so I think the combination of those things is absolutely really important. I have a video that I did uh, a few months ago, maybe saying like the benefits of using ESLint because it's going to force you to write better code or, or at least give you a style regardless of what your preferences are give you a style and consistency in code and make you think about some of the things that you're doing. So um, A plus on that one, I like that a lot. Tracking JavaScript issues in your editor. Um, 
This is interesting. So get tracking code base issues in the editor allows engineers to get full visibility on larger issues like tech debt. See context for code base issue. All right, so it looks like they are referencing a VS Code extension called Step Size. I'm actually kind of curious uh, what this is. So it's a do manager, gotcha. Oh, this is really cool. Um, I wonder if anybody, if you're using this one already, uh, I have been using a an extension called uh, VS Code Better Comments. I've used this extension. Uh, I don't use it as often as I should sometimes, but it just gives like color highlighting. And I think you can tab through them uh, with shortcuts. This looks like it gives you a lot to track. So that's actually pretty cool. So being able to have, uh, I don't know if they come, I wonder if how they're saved to the code, if they're saved through comments, document code without polluting it with, without polluting it with comments. So the interesting thing would be here, question, and I don't know the answer to this, how does this carry over to uh, to other people using the project? Does it get saved in a configuration file that does get checked in the source code where other people will see them too? Uh, kind of interesting. Um, I, you know, I would debate about that with like just issues in GitHub, et cetera. So I'm kind of curious what other people would think about that. Uh, but an interesting take here and uh, tracking your issues in your editor. I am also a big fan. I've done a lot of videos about this on tracking or doing as many things in the place that you spend the most time as possible. So things like, um, I don't know, testing API requests with the rapid API client extension inside of VS Code just using extensions inside of VS Code to do the things that you could do elsewhere uh, so you can stay in one consistent spot. So I'm a big fan of that. Uh, utilizing, this is like the, the British spelling. So for Americans, uh, this becomes really obvious, uh, but utilizing template strings is, uh, is a fun one. I love template strings. I almost always use them by default and I forget what the extension is, but I have an extension where if I have, if I have, maybe I can show you this. Can I open up a piece of code? Cool. All right. I've got a piece of code over here. Uh, this is for the everything felt course. If you're interested, everything's felt.com. But I have an extension that if I then add a dollar sign and the brackets, notice that converted that to a template literal string. So I'll do this one more time. So dollar sign bracket, and then move this over here if I had a, uh, a variable called password. So I have a couple of tools in here to uh, automatically convert this to template literal strings. There may be an extension to just convert every string to template literal strings, but I'm a big fan. I think a lot of us find ourselves in situations where we have um, we have a very we have a, a just a, a log statement like this. Then we want to add a variable inside of it, so we end up uh, either concatenating strings, which is gross, or we end up going in and adding uh, adding template literal strings. So, ut utilizing regex when needing to search strings. Uh, this is really interesting. Regex is one of those things that is extremely powerful. <laughs> and it's it's probably not as complicated, honestly, as I think it is and as other people think it is. It's just because I don't do it on a consistent basis. But regex is a, a pretty tricky thing, a pretty tricky syntax to get comfortable with. It's one of the things that I don't need often enough to actually get the practice to remember how to write regex and the syntax and stuff. But I do agree it can be an amazingly powerful tool, uh, extremely powerful parsing tool, construct complex patterns, et cetera. I'm kind of curious how, like, it'd be interesting to see a side-by-side -side of like, here's what you might do versus here's how it would be with regex. That would be cool to see here in terms of like what the readability and the, what do we say here? Uh, the clean code. The other thing is actually readability. So for some people reading regex, maybe uh, a regex ex or, regular expression regex would be maybe more complicated than another alternative to searching. So I'd be curious, that would be a great example, I think, to see two side by sides there. <laughs> Utilizing optional chaining. Uh, optional chaining is a feature in JavaScript uh, ES8, maybe I can't. Let's actually see if it'll tell us in here. Let's see when was optional chaining released in JavaScript? ES 2020 optional chaining was introduced in ES 2020. Cool. So it's even uh, newer than I thought. So optional chaining is very nice. I'm a big fan of optional chaining. And basically what this allows you to do, we can see in here, we'll zoom in more. If you have like a piece of data that you don't know if uh, you're, if it's going to actually be an object or it could be null or undefined, et cetera. And you want to access a payload property from that data. 
Uh, and then you don't know if there's going to be a payload data. Then you want to access workspace from payload, et cetera. So you do the optional chaining, which says like, if this thing exists, then let me try to get the next operator. If not, it'll uh, just return uh, false, I guess, or null. I guess I should actually double check that. Um, but it allows you to give you, it gives you a syntax to kind of shorten all these checks. So in here you would check data, then you would check data.payload, then you would check the property that you're looking for. Uh, so yes, I, I'm a big fan of this. I think uh, optional, optional chaining is uh, pretty cool. It is newer, so some JavaScript developers may not be as useful or as used to it or comfortable with it. So make sure with your team, it's something that you're comfortable with. Avoid nesting in clean code. So nesting is a surefire way to increase the complexity of your code and make it harder to read and comprehend. Consider refactoring it when it's more than two levels deep by having root level return conditions and shorter blocks. I have a perfect example of this and I promise I didn't plan it. Inside of this update uh, password flow uh, for this course. So this is with Superbase and SvelteKit. It's kind of fun. There's multiple conditions in here that I check that I short circuit uh, out of this function. So uh, if the new password and the confirmed password don't match as they're trying to update their password, we do an alert message, we set loading to false, and then we return. So the alternative to this could be like if you didn't return and then did an else and then did the rest of the stuff. But I then have another condition here. If there is no session, do this thing. I then also eventually will have another condition here and then another condition here. So instead of nesting all of these, this would be like four deep. I am choosing to uh, return instead. So we do a check, we return. That way I can keep my same level of depth in terms of code and I can just continue on. I, I like that readability. Um, I, I'm not 100% sold on that all the time. Uh, but in this case, I chose uh, this as a format. I actually mentioned this in the course of like, you could do this different ways, obviously. So I think I think that's a reasonable expectation here is just to look for ways to not nest your code so much. And we've all probably seen uh, callback hell in JavaScript. So if we just look at like a image here, there's tons of them. So here's callback hell. You call a function that uh, return or you pass it a callback. You call another function inside of that callback, which returns uh, a call or you give it a callback that it calls back to, et cetera. They're pretty funny. Uh, but this is gross. Like that's really hard, especially when it's not just one liners in there. That's a tough thing to follow. So I think uh, paying attention to how nested your code is absolutely a great tip. Uh, comment all atypical code, but don't let it replace uh, code re readability. I'm actually curious. Feel free to just drop general comments or uh, opinions on comments in code. You have everyone like I think in school you're taught like comment everything, and then you end up writing comments that are just completely unnecessary and are for things that are very obvious. Then you have other people who are like, don't write comments at all. Your code should be readable, et cetera. And I think tips for that are making really clear and descriptive names for variables and functions and classes and stuff. Like don't, don't sacrifice, don't try to be really short with names, be more descriptive with them. So it's more obvious what they are. I've talked about this in a few different videos. So that's a fun one too, um, or a good tip, I think. And then there's, there's in reality, there's kind of the in-between. Like your code should be readable from the things that we talked about uh, so far from naming conventions, et cetera. But also you have times where maybe you had to hack something and you um, or there's like a weird reason why something had to be the way that it is. Uh, and I've been in this where I work on a project with other people and I go in and change something because I'm like, why would you do that? That seems silly. And I change it and then it, ends up that I did something wrong because it had to be that way, but I just didn't understand that because it wasn't obvious. So I think there absolutely is a use case for comments at times. I think it's less of a requirement or less of an encouragement than it used to be. Now it's really only in the right place. And I think a, a really addition or a really awesome addition to this list uh, for clean code would be to use TypeScript. Like TypeScript has become so popular. I am more and more a fan of TypeScript every single day. And I think it just forces you to think more about the code that you're writing and uh, it works really well when you like combine with something like ESLint uh, for formatting, IntelliSense, all the things. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of TypeScript, so I think that would be a really awesome addition here. So anyway, I'm curious, uh, what do you think of the list of eight here? Make sure to go check out the article from Alex O'Meyer. I'll have a link to that again um, here so you can go and support him as a creator and as a share of his opinions in JavaScript. But what do you think is missing? Let me know in the comments below. And if you have any like best practice question topics in JavaScript that you'd like to see in a future video, 
let me know that as well. Anyways, hope you enjoy the video and I'll catch you next time.